Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a new um, health law seminar. I think people are. Oh, I think I was saying um, people are still trickling in, but I think we're going to get started with uh, the introductions and um, people can still join. Um, my name is Adelina Iftene. I am um, the associate director of the Health Law Institute at Dalhousie University. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today uh, Dr. Ingrid Waldron. She will be talking about um, troubled waters and the health and mental health impacts on environmental racism. So a very important topic today. Um, and I am uh, looking forward both to the talk, to the, to the talk and to the discussion. Um, before I introduce Dr. Waldron, I, uh, I want to a couple, uh, point out a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, rules. Um, so we have uh, live closed captioning. You're going to see that in your uh, corner right. Uh, at least that's what it is uh, for me. So just make sure to turn it on if you, if you wish to use it. Um, also, you're going to see on the, on the bar, um, there is a Q&A box. So I'm going to ask that uh, any questions that you have, please uh, type them in there, and uh, I am going to put them to Dr. Waldron after um, her uh, after her talk. Um, so, without uh, further ado, I'm just gonna um, introduce Dr. Waldron. Uh, she is the professor and hope chair in peace and health in the Global Peace and Social Justice Program in the Faculty of Humanities at McMaster University. And um, actually from 2008 to 2021, uh, Dr. Waldron was a professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University. Um, so a very strong connection to us. Dr. Waldron's research, teaching and community advocacy work focus on environmental racism, climate justice, mental illness, COVID-19, and the structural and environmental determinants of health disparities in black, indigenous, immigrant, and refugee communities. Dr. Waldron is the founder and director of the Environmental Nauseousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, the Enrich Project, um, which uh, inspired the federal private uh, member bills, a national strategy respecting environmental racism and environmental justice, which is Bill C-230. Um, her Netflix documentary, There's Something in the Water, is based on her book of the same name and was co-produced by Waldron, actor Elliot Page, Ian Daniel, and Julia Sanderson. Dr. Waldron is also the co-founder of the Canadian Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice, which has brought together organizations in the environmental, climate, and social justice sectors to share expertise and resources to address environmental racism, climate change, and other social injustices in Black, Indigenous, and other racialized communities across Canada. So we are very lucky to uh, have Dr. Waldron here uh, with us to talk about her work um, on the impact of environmental uh, injustice and racism on, uh, on health. Dr. Waldron. Thank you very much, Adelina. Thanks to everyone for being here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I would like to begin uh, with a quote by 20-something uh, environmental activist, Vanessa Gray, uh, who's an Amgen Wong First Nation near Sarnia, Ontario. And Vanessa says, the land is our mother. So when we lose value for the land, people lose value for the women. And indeed, indigenous and black women have been building grassroots environmental and social justice movements for decades to challenge the legal, political, and corporate agendas that sanction and enable environmental racism and other forms of colonial violence in their communities. Colonial gendered violence continues today and includes the crisis of missing and murdered women, the displacement of indigenous peoples from their lands by corporate resource extraction projects, anti-Black and anti-Indigenous police violence and other forms of state-sanctioned violence. Colonization and genocide are tied to the intersections of Indigenous lands and bodies. Women experience violence because they are the ones that are responsible for taking care of the land and holding it for future generations. Therefore, gendered violence that harms women specifically also harms nations, making it much easier to take possession of the land. 
for Indigenous women specifically, production and reproduction, land and life, and resistance and survival are all intimately connected. There is no separation. Therefore, the Indigenous role in fighting against environmental racism by defending their land and territory and protecting their water are acts of resistance against gendered oppression. So what is environmental racism? This uh, was a question that was posed to me often when I was in Halifax back in 2012 when I started my project on environmental racism. A lot of people were not aware of the term and they thought that the term was peculiar. Um, so in order to kind of explain the term environmental racism, I, I always pull up this um, slide with uh, James Desmond. James Desmond is a longtime environmental activist in the African Nova Scotian community of Lincolnville. And in 2013, because uh, my project is community-based, I wanted to meet the communities. I wanted to drive down to their communities and meet with them and get a sense from them what my, how my research should look. What should my research objectives be? What should my research questions be? Which is not typically what academics do. Typically, we decide on those things and then we put it through to ethics. Uh, but I wanted to hear from them. I wanted to get a sense of their priorities. Um, and I filmed the workshops and uh, we filmed uh, James and we asked him um, if he could uh, define environmental racism. And this is how James defined it. He says the practice has been locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. And the reason I like this definition is because it's very simple, but at the same time, it's extremely layered and it has all or most of the components of the definition of environmental racism in it. Uh, for example, when he, when he highlights African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, uh, he is saying that the communities that are disproportionately uh, selected for the siting of harmful industries tend to be communities that are non-white or racialized. But he's also saying that it could include uh, white communities as well. It's not as often, but it, you know, I think of uh, Nova Scotia and I think of uh, Harriet's Field. Harriet's Field is a low income, I believe rural white community that has been trying to address uh, water contamination since I think the 1980s. And I know that um, uh, the East Coast Environmental Law Association in Halifax has been supporting that community. So, you know, environmental racism certainly can include white communities. Um, the definition also uh, highlights an inter the need for an intersectional analysis on this particular issue. Um, when I started the project, people approached me and they said, uh, well, isn't this really about class? You know, why, why are you making it about race? It's really about class. And I would respond by saying, why can't it be about race and class and gender and geography um, and culture? Right, so uh, it's very much, we very much need an intersectional analysis when we, when we talk about environmental racism, the communities that are impacted are yes, uh, typically low income dealing with income insecurity and other structural inequities, but they're also at the same time racialized. Um, and they also live in uh, rural, in the case of African Nova Scotians, isolated, uh, communities and on reserves, right? So communities that are far away from the minds of politicians often. These are typically communities uh, that don't get to be heard, although uh, they have been fighting for a long time and they've certainly tried to make their voices heard. So when you look at those intersections of, of race and uh, social class and education and living in out of the way places, then you can understand why these are the communities that oftentimes lack political, social, and economic clout. And when you don't have social, political, and economic clout, then yes, it's much more difficult uh, to have your voices heard and to have government act on these issues in a timely manner. So, you know, when he says they don't have a base to fight back, he's basically saying that they don't have political clout, economic clout, social clout, uh, making it much more difficult for them to resist the siting of industries in their communities. But I also want to give you a more academic definition of environmental racism. This comes from Dr. Robert Bullard, who is considered to be the father of environmental justice. And he teaches um, in Texas. 
And he says uh, that environmental racism is racial discrimination in the disproportionate location and greater exposure of indigenous and racialized communities to contamination and pollution. And this is basically what James Desmond just said. You know, I, as I said, James talked about disproportionality. Certain communities are disproportionately cited uh, for, uh, are disproportionately selected for the siting of harmful industries. So what we often see is a spatial patterning of industry in certain communities. The second aspect of the definition is a lack of political power. As James also mentioned in many ways, these communities have for resisting the placement of industrial polluters because of all the things I said earlier, uh, intersections of race, uh, class, socioeconomic status, geography, or residence in rural or out of the way places or on reserves. It's also about the implementation of policies that sanction the harmful and in many cases, life-threatening poisons in these communities. So when we see the spatial patterning of industry in certain communities, primarily racialized communities across Canada and in Nova Scotia, it's, it doesn't just happen. It's a result of policy, specifically environmental policies and even more specifically environmental assessments. Um, we've heard of environmental assessments. These are tools that are used to decide where a particular project gets placed. And ultimately the projects, as I said, end up in racialized communities. So when we think about why this is happening, the root cause would be the implementation of policies that have been developed, for example, in departments of environment across Canada uh, that allow these industries to be cited in certain communities. And then we have the disproportionate negative impacts of environmental policies that result in differential rates of cleanup. So when you think of, for example, P2 Landing First Nation and why it took over 40 years uh, for the government to act on uh, uh, Boat Harbor or the contamination of Boat Harbor, Boat Harbor this is what is meant by this particular um, uh, definition of environmental racism, uh, that there's differential cleanups. And sometimes when you are a member of um, a lower socioeconomic class or you are racialized, um, you find that the rate of cleanup is very different from communities that are higher income or members of the elite class, right? You can see distinctions in terms of how government responds, how they act, how quickly they act. Uh, so that's when you have to kind of ask, why does it take so long for certain communities uh, to get action on their issues? And finally, the history of excluding indigenous and racialized communities from mainstream environmental groups, decision-making boards, commissions, and regulatory bodies. In other words, the people who are most impacted by environmental racism are the people who are not invited to the table. These are not the people that you see at the table. These are not the people who are making decisions. Uh, these are not the people who are developing policies. And when we don't include or invite people who are most impacted, then, uh, it, then environmental racism manifests over time. It continues to happen uh, intergenerationally uh, because we're not hearing from, from uh, people who are impacted. We're not hearing about their perspectives. We're not hearing about their priorities. You're not hearing about how they uh, would like to see cleanup happen, right? So it's not coming from a community voice. And then it continues over time. And that's why we see in Canada, for example, or in Nova Scotia or Canada, that environmental racism, or there's been a legacy of environmental racism over the past, uh, I would say, 70 years, uh, when you think of uh, Shelburne, which has had a dump since 1943. So I just want to kind of provide you with the few case studies on environmental racism across Canada, beginning with uh, Nova Scotia, of course. Uh, this is Doreen Bernard and uh, her community, Sabaganagadi First Nation, has been fighting the Alton Gas Brine Discharge Pipeline Project since about 2014. And they've engaged in a number of activities on online and on site at the Treaty Truck House uh, to halt this project. Uh, they contend that proper consultations were not done with the community. There were some Indigenous communities that were consulted, but their community was not consulted and they did not give prior informed consent. Uh, in 2016, then Environment Minister Margaret Miller said that consultations do not need to be done. Consultations have been done properly. No further consultations are required. Um, but last year in March, the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia disagreed with her 
and ordered the province to consult with this community for 120 days. This was a major achievement in March of last year because this is something that this community has been seeking for some time. I, I've really admired this community because of the fact that they've halted this project for almost seven years um, by engaging in various kind of acts of resistance. Um, but then there was good news, as you probably, of course, you know, you're in Nova Scotia last uh, week. Was it last week or this week? I think it was this week that the project has been canceled. So major achievement for this for this uh, community. Here is a boat harbor, um, a very contaminated uh, site um, since 1967. Northern pulp mill has been dumping effluent into Boat Harbor. And over the years, particularly perhaps in, in the 1980s, more specifically, there's been a lot of kind of pushback by, by the community uh, asking the government uh, to close the mill, et cetera. And there have been a lot of broken promises over the past uh, 30 years, the government promising to close the mill, but that never happening. And then in 2015, a decision was made that in five years, uh, it would close. And um, I, I believe the government in Nova Scotia was asking uh, the, the mill to, to provide them with uh, an environmental assessment that was robust. And that came to him last year or in 2019. And he said that it wasn't done very well and that it wasn't robust enough and we can't continue to make broken promises to this community and we need to close the mill. And he made that announcement uh, the week of Christmas in 2019. And as you know, as Nova Scotians, there was a lot of um, friction, anger, people lost their jobs. Uh, members of the community, Big Two Landing First Nation, uh, were threatened with bodily harm, including uh, Chief Andrea Paul and her daughter. And you know, so it wasn't a really good time around February, uh, January of uh, 2020. Uh, but the mill did close uh, at the end of January 2020. However, and, and, and then cleanup was supposed to happen. Um, but I've been hearing that cleanup has not been going well. So I do want to find out a little bit more uh, about that. So maybe I'll contact uh, Michelle Francis Denny about that because she was very much involved um, in this particular issue. She's moved on, I know, but uh, I'm hearing cleanup isn't going well. Maybe some of you know a little bit more than I do. Uh, we've got Amgen Wong First Nation on the screen. I consider this to be one of the worst cases of environmental racism in Canada, along with uh, Boat Harbor. So this is a community, it's often referred to as Chemical Valley. So once again, Amgen Wong First Nation, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, this is in Sarnia, Ontario. And this is a stunning, I think a stunning example of environmental racism when you have over 60 petrochemical facilities surrounding this community within a 25 square kilometer area. Like all of the communities that I've gotten to know, um, you know, they have to contend with significant health problems uh, because of this reproductive illnesses. I'll talk about this later, but a lot of health issues like the communities that I'm that I've come to know in, in Nova Scotia. So for me, this is a this is this is a one of the worst, if not the worst case of environmental racism in, in Canada in terms of how long it's been going on, but just uh, the spatial, the clustering of industry so close uh, to the to the community and to have over 60 petrochemical facilities surrounding the community is is to me shameful. Um, you've also probably heard of Grassy Narrows First Nation. Um, this is near Kenora, Ontario, and they've long been concerned about mercury contamination. There was cleanup, I believe, a few years ago, yes. Uh, millions of dollars um, provided to the cleanup. However, you know, one thing that I often say is that even when there is cleanup or a dump is closed, the health effects remain. Right, so this, the community still has to deal with the health effects. So yes, there's cleanup, but there's still a lot of concerns about uh, the link between mercury contamination and uh, various uh, illnesses, including uh, cancer. I would say over the past four years, the community that has gotten a lot of attention is Wet'suwet'en First Nation in BC. 
So mass demonstrations, sit-ins, and blockades have gripped parts of Canada over the movement to support the leaders of Wet'suwet'en First Nation who are opposed to this multi-billion dollar pipeline project in Northern BC. I think a lot of people don't realize that there are black communities impacted uh, by environmental racism. And as you are in Nova Scotia, you will of course know about Africville. Um, Africville for me is both an example of environmental racism and gentrification, or if you wanna call it urban renewal. Some people don't like those terms, particularly urban renewal. Some people would say, what are you renewing? Um, this is a case of expropriation of a community, a government, the city of Halifax, trying to make way for industrial development in the early 1960s, and they needed the community to move out. So the community was pushed out or expropriated and moved into other areas. I believe the church was burnt down as well uh, at night, and some community members were actually moved out on dump trucks. Um, so the, to me, the expropriation of African Nova Scotians from Africville is kind of, um, an example of uh, Nova Scotia's shameful past. Um, so this was, as I said, amidst an urban renewal campaign. Um, but as uh, the government was making way for industrial development, what was left in its wake were a number of social and environmental hazards. And this is why I say this is also, in addition to being an example of gentrification, it's also an example of environmental racism. So, so the social and environmental hazards included a fertilizer plant, a slaughterhouse, a tar factory, a stone and coal crushing plant, a cotton factory, a prison, three systems of railway tracks and an open dump. Um, while this community is no longer, the descendants uh, are here obviously and the descendants uh, have been rising up over the past several years in 2016. Um, 2016, they requested a class action lawsuit, but that was thrown out in 2018. I'm not sure what's happening since then, but I do know that the community has been uh, engaged in a lot of demonstrations, uh, including late last year, where there was a march, I believe, to Province House uh, from the park near Africville or in Africville to Province House. So this, and then there was a, there was a online and kind of, yeah, there was a GoFundMe page as well and petitions, I believe. So the community is still very much active in seeking specifically reparations uh, from the fallout of expropriation. Many of them lost their homes as they were moved into other areas. So they're seeking reparations um, and uh, perhaps an apology. Although an apology was made in 2011 by the mayor at that time in Nova Scotia, but a lot of people weren't satisfied with it. And of course the Africville Museum uh, was part of that apology. And a lot of people are, were not um, happy about the museum. They wanted a little bit more. So there are kind of two sides, I, I guess. Uh, some African Nova Scotian descendants of Africville happy with the museum um, and others feeling that that wasn't enough. They want more. We have Lincolnville. I showed you a photo of James Desmond earlier. He provided a definition of environmental racism. This is Lincolnville. I traveled, as I said, to Lincolnville in 2013, and my research assistant took this uh, photo when we went there. Um, they've had a dump in their community since uh, 1974. And then in 2006, a second generation landfill was put on top of the first generation landfill. So of course, they're very, very concerned about contamination, uh, contamination from the landfills. And, over, the, over time, their community has also gathered together, have formed an NGO or a group, I think it's the Lincolnville, or oh, I forgot the name of their group. They changed the name of it, but they've been engaged in a lot of marches and protests, uh, requesting that the government uh, meet with them over the years. And I think one of the things that they wanted is to have this landfill redirected. Um, I, I don't personally think it's going to happen, but. Um, just through my Enrich project, I've tried to support the community in other ways because I, I don't think this landfill will ever be redirected. But like the other communities, uh, high rates of cancer, they would say, that is connected uh, to this landfill. Then we have Shelburne. Uh, Shelburne, the African Nova Scotian community in Shelburne has had uh, a landfill since 1943. I typically use the formal name of this landfill, which is the Morvan Road landfill. 
but the community says this is the Shelburne town dump. And they often say to me, Ingrid, you're using the term landfill, that's way too polite. This is not a landfill, this is a dump because a landfill tends to be controlled and a dump well is not controlled. And basically everything and anything went into this, this dump um, starting in 1943, including um, stuff from the military base, uh, stuff from the hospitals like syringes and everything else. So it wasn't a controlled um, landfill, therefore I guess it's a dump. Um, what was great is that I met uh, the environmental activist Louise DeLille from this community uh, in December of 2015. I wanted to hire her to do some focus groups in her community um, about, the, about the health effects of the dump. And she told me when I first met with her that about 90% of the people in her community have cancer. And I thought, well, that's not likely, that can't be. It, it sounded very strange to me, but you know, since I've known her over the past, what, six years, you know, the amount of time she, she reaches out to me to tell me that somebody else has died in her community from cancer, I find it quite stunning. And I also remember reading an article a while ago about uh, Cancer Alley in Louisiana in the United States. This is an African American community that's surrounded by petro petrochemical facilities and they call it Cancer Alley and almost everybody has cancer. So it's not, it's not, it is, it's highly probable, likely that there's a connection certainly between the dump and uh, cancer, high rates of cancer in Shelburne and specifically multiple myeloma. There are high rates of cancer, or sorry, high rates of multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer in Shelburne. Uh, one of the things I never say as a researcher is I never say definitively yes, because you have to be cautious, right, to make those links, but the community is certainly uh, certain about this, uh, that there is a link. Uh, what's, what's great, and it's a great achievement in this community, is that after Louise did the focus groups, uh, the community formed an NGO called the South End Environmental Injustice Society, and they succeeded in getting the land, the dump, closed at the end of 2016. So a major achievement, however, once again, the health effects remain. Uh, they're still concerned about the health effects. So I talked a lot about health. And there is a term in the environmental justice literature uh, to talk about health disparities um, with respect to toxic burdens. And that term is environmental health inequities. And there are a lot of doubters, particularly in government, but other people who do doubt the link between cancer and a toxic site. Uh, but over the past 20 years in Canada, there has been literature uh, looking at the connections between toxic burdens and health. Uh, so environmental health inequities across racial dimensions have been well documented in the literature in Canada, which has provided strong evidence that indigenous black and other racialized communities are exposed to greater health risk compared to other communities because they're more likely to be spatially clustered around waste disposal sites and other environmental hazards. Some of these uh, issues are gastrointestinal diseases, cancer I talked about earlier, rare cancers, um, respiratory illness. Uh, there's some literature now showing the connection between autism and environmental toxins. But I also like to put a kind of gendered lens on this when I talk about environmental health inequities. Um, and that's when, you know, earlier I talked about the need to have an intersectional analysis when we talk about environmental racism, but particularly when we talk about the health effects of environmental racism, because we know that um, based on your gender, you're going to experience the health effects of toxins in very different ways. So I just want to highlight the experiences of women, uh, of Indigenous women specifically, and I see environmental racism as operating if I go back to the beginning of my lecture when I talked about gendered colonialism, operating as a specific form of colonial, racialized, and gendered violence in the way that it impacts the bodies and well being and health of Indigenous and Black women. And one of the most insidious ways in which environmental racism impacts Indigenous and Black women is through the detrimental health effects of toxic contaminants on their reproductive health including high levels of toxins in breast milk and placenta cord blood, as well as infertility, miscarriages, premature births, premature menopause, 
reproductive system cancers, and an inability to produce healthy children due to compromised endocrine and immune systems while in utero. I think the literature often, what's absent in the literature is the psychological impacts of environmental racism, something that I'm interested in looking at. And I've started to look at that. Uh, I did a workshop earlier this year in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, where we looked specifically at the mental health impacts of environmental racism. We need to think about environmental stress. We need to think about the psychosocial stressors related to living or knowing you're living there to a dump for many reasons. You know, and I think of uh, Mary Desmond in Lincolnville, who said to me back in 2013, I I don't drink the water. I just drink bottled water. Water. My husband drank the water and now he's dead. Um, or I think of Louise DeLeo during a press conference I held with uh, the environment, East Coast Environmental Law Association in 2017, where Louise said, not only are we black and poor, but people see us as the dump because we live near the dump. And she talks often about how this has impacted the self-esteem of people in Shelburne and particularly young people. So we do need to think about psychosocial stressors and the health impacts of uh, living near to dumps and what that does to communities and their self-esteem. So I wanna talk finally about some of the activities I've engaged in through the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, the Enrich Project, over the years, I started this project in 2012 uh, after an environmental activist who had been really engaged in Lincolnville and other communities in Nova Scotia. And he was leaving to live in uh, Oakland, California. And he wanted to make sure that all the work that activists had done over the years would be sustained in some way. So he chose me. I don't know why he chose me because I often tell people I was not in this field at all. I was in health, but I knew absolutely nothing about the environment. And in many ways, I'm still playing catch up, you know, because this was not my field. It wasn't my PhD. This came to me late in my career. Um, but I felt I could bring something to it as a sociologist because I am a sociologist of race and ethnicity. I'm a health researcher. I look at the health impacts of racism. And I thought, okay, I can bring something to this even though I'm not an expert. I'm not an environmental scientist, for example. So I went about it my way and I said, I, this needs to be community-based. This needs to be from the perspectives of community members. But because I noticed in Nova Scotia that a lot of people were asking me, well, I've never heard of this term. What is environmental racism? Isn't it about class and not race? I said, well, I need to do awareness raising. And I did a lot of that in Nova Scotia over the years to just you know, workshops and public engagement. This is a, a this is an event. This this is my favorite event actually ever uh, that I held at the Central Library in Nova Scotia in 2015. I just love this event. We had we had drummers. Uh, we had Indigenous African drummers. It was it was uplifting, but it was educational. It was informative. It was packed. You know, we had a lot of people, and we had people here as you see on the screen from different perspectives. It was just really my favorite event of all time. And I continue to do that now because I'm always meeting people who say, I, I, I don't know what this is. I've never heard of this term. Not really in Nova Scotia. I think in Nova Scotia, compared to other parts of Canada, I think a lot of people in Nova Scotia know this term now, environmental racism. But when I travel to other parts of Canada, they would say, I, I, I don't know. I have never heard of this. It's a peculiar term. Uh, so raising awareness is great because it raises awareness. But I've also found that raising awareness also gets people to act, of course, right? Because if people don't know about an issue, they're not going to empathize on the issue. And if they don't empathize on the issue, then they're not gonna act. And when I hold my events, uh, what, what typically has happened is that people attend it, they email me, they, said, they say to me, I've never heard of this. I can't believe this is in my backyard. I'm from Nova Scotia, but it's stunning. Please tell me what I can do. That, that was always happening when I was in Nova Scotia. And then I get people who wanna volunteer which of course for faculty members great because there are times when I don't have a grant, right? So you get people who are enthusiastic, particularly young people, particularly students, students like yourselves um, who just say, I wanna help in any way. Um, yeah, this really, this inspired me, this event and I wanna do something. So for me, that's why events have been really important to create kind of a sense of empathy and action around the issue. As a faculty member, of course, I have to publish 
Um, it's part of my job, but it's also important to publish because of course policymakers like data and they, they want to see research on the issue. Um, they, like, they like statistical research, they like quantitative research, but they also like stories. And I'm mostly a qualitative researcher, although I do some mixed methods uh, studies, but I like to share stories. Uh, because this is community-based, I can't pack my book with a bunch of stats. We want to hear the voices of community members. And this is what I did with this book. This book is kind of a journey through the Enrich Project, what I've done over the years. It was published in 2018 in April. Um, the voices of the communities, you know, are throughout this book. Uh, in chapter five, I focus on health. Um, in other chapters, in chapter six, I believe I look specifically at the resistance and mobilizing activities that these communities have engaged in uh, over the past 70 years. Um, so it was a thrill for me to, to write this book. I wasn't really expecting to, I was asked to by the publisher, by Fernwood. Uh, so this isn't something that I sought out. Um, he just reached out and we met and he said, I want you to do this book. And I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, thankfully I kept a journal of what was happening throughout my project. And uh, so it made, it made writing the book much easier. There's also a map that uh, I had my research assistant do in 2016. A lot of people were doubting the reality of environmental racism. You know, they would email me, as I said in the beginning, mostly Nova Scotians saying, uh, you know, I don't, I really don't believe this exists. And there are white communities as well that are near to toxic landfills. And isn't this about class and about race? And so there was a lot of that in the beginning. And after this map was developed, you know, a lot of the naysayers actually, they kind of, some of them came back to me and they said, oh, okay, I can, I can see it because this map actually shows the proximity of black and indigenous communities to incinerators, pulp and paper mills, landfills, et cetera. So if you go onto my website for the Enrich Project, you will see two layers of this map, one for Mi'kmaq communities, one for African Nova Scotian communities. So it, it tells you what the communities are, the names of the communities, and then the waste sites that are near to these communities. And what my research assistant also did, which I love because I'm a health researcher, is that he also, he also did an annotated bibliography with health information. So what he did was he looked at what are the materials, the waste, the substances inside each of these waste sites, for example, an incinerator, a pulp and paper mill, a landfill. And then he went on to the, I think mostly the EPA website, that's the United States, and he looked at the health risks. So this is like a health risk assessment. So he also produced that based on this map as well. In 2016, as I said earlier, I don't think the landfill in Lincolnville will ever be redirected. I mean, that's what the community has wanted, but I think it's kind of, yeah, that's not gonna happen. So my team said, well, how, how else can we support them? And we, we recognize that they've been wanting water testing for some time, but they didn't want the government to do it because of course they didn't trust the government. The government would say, you know, everything is a-okay. So we thought, why don't we do a water testing project? And we got together a working group comprised of myself, a hydrogeologist who happened to actually to be sitting in the audience of that event I just showed you, which is why I say events are great because he was sitting in the audience and he emailed me the next day and he said, I, I attended your event yesterday, it was wonderful, but have you ever thought of giving the community something tangible? I was a bit taken aback, <laughs> about to get defensive because I'm thinking I'm doing so much, you know, with, with this topic of environmental racism, I'm doing so much and how dare he <laughs> uh, suggest that I'm not doing enough. But I didn't say anything to him and I didn't get defensive and I said, I just need to shut my mouth and I need to listen which I did, and he sat in my office and he said, we need to give the community something tangible. We need to give them a win so they continue to be invested in your project. And I said, well, what would that be? He said, well, let's test their water. I said, I don't know how to do that. He said, well, yeah, but I'm a hydrogeologist. I know how to do that. So then we got together, as I said, the working group, uh, chemistry professor at Nova Scotia Community College, the hydrogeologist, two environmental science students, and we tested uh, the water in Lincolnville. We got the samples. We we did a, a final report, shared the findings, went back to the communities, did a few workshops on how to manage your drinking water supply, et cetera, et cetera. And then after the project, we said, this really worked well. So in 2017, we said, why don't we use that water testing project as a blueprint to develop a new NGO? And we did in April 27, 2017. 
we founded Rural Water Watch. And here's the acronym where we now are testing water in rural Nova Scotian communities, not necessarily only black or indigenous, any community that's a rural Nova Scotian community, we test water. As you probably know, uh, rural communities uh, tend to be, maybe not all of them, on well water, some of them, and well water tends to be more contaminated. So uh, our, our objectives are to test water in rural communities, do workshops, but also to train students. So that's part of the work as well as to train mostly environment, it's been environmental science students who come and they, they're actually, some of them are actually leading projects as well. Um, we started last year, Healthy Wells Day, where we educate the public about the need to keep your well healthy because an unhealthy well or a cracked well or an old well can cause many health issues, right? So we do that work that's like a ra awareness raising event. We do it online using infographics and posters. And we also do it in person where we go into selected communities, maybe three communities. We did three communities last year and we take their water samples, we test it and we give them the results. So I'm really, I'm really proud of this organization because it's tangible and it's giving something back to the community. So thank God I listened to the hydrogeologist instead of getting defensive. I've also consulted with EcoJustice. As you know, they have an office in Halifax on Paula Street. They opened in 2018 and I immediately booked an appointment and went down to talk to them about the communities in Nova Scotia that were dealing with environmental issues. I'm sure I didn't need to tell them. I'm sure they already knew, but I just wanted to kind of have them meet me. And over the past few years, they've been working with these communities, including Shelburne, um, looking at legal remedies. Of course, it's confidential. I don't know what's happening. It's none of my business. In order for me to know, I would have to get the permission of the communities, which I, I have, but uh, right now I'm not quite sure what is happening with this. What's great is that um, we were able to provide the water testing results to them. You know, I didn't know there was gonna be a connection in any way, but uh, we did some water testing in Lincolnville and eventually in Shelburne, and they were able to use uh, that information in their activities. I'm getting into climate change more and more. I have to admit that it's not a topic that I was really into uh, because I felt that environmental racism was huge and that the Enrich project was huge and it was keeping me busy. And I couldn't take anything on, but as we all know, climate, uh, climate change is the issue of the day. And I said, I need to get involved in this, this issue. So in March of this year, I selected three African Nova Scotian communities, East Preston, Shelburne and Truro uh, to do climate change workshops in collaboration with Climate Action Services. This is, uh, these are retired climate scientists. And uh, so we met in 2019. And then in, tw in March of this year, we did the workshops to look at um, some of the social, environmental, political, and health issues that shape climate change adaptation. For example, in Shelburne, you know, we talk uh, often about the need for communities to engage in climate change adaptation, but sometimes we don't ask, do they have the resources to do that? Do they have the networks? Do they have the supports? Typ typically low income racialized communities do not, right? So we have this kind of normative understanding that everybody's gonna be able to engage in climate change adaptation, but we have to ask the question in terms of the legacy of racism, colonialism, uh, the lack of resources, poverty, all these issues that impact racialized low-income communities, they have to be prepared because they experience uh, in, uh, climate change in very specific and unique ways. So do they have the resources to adapt? Um, so that project was finished in April and I'm looking to perhaps do future work in this area in terms of a study because the community, uh, the communities were very surprised that they enjoyed the workshops. They didn't think they would be interested or that engaged, but they said they, they wanted more. Uh, so hopefully I can do more. Um, I don't know what time is it? Yeah, so it's okay. I think I have a little bit more time. Yeah, so what has been uh, thrilling for me when I was at Dalhousie is, is the recognition that environmental racism is incredibly, in, is incredibly interdisciplinary. I guess you can say that about any topic actually. But the reason this was highlighted for me, the kind of interdisciplinary, multi-sectoral nature of the topic of environmental racism is because of the amount of students that I got from varying departments across campus in Dal Dalhousie, which surprised me. 
Um, you know, I had the law students in the law school invite me to do talks and I had sociology students and planning students and med medical students and nursing students and well, who else? Environmental science students, environmental studies, and then geography students from other uh, universities. I think it's St. Was it St. Mary's? Um, I've had students approach me to volunteer from so many different departments that I realized quickly that this is so interdisciplinary. And it, it's great for me because of course I'm learning. I'm learning from students and I'm learning from faculty in different disciplines, but I'm I'm putting a different lens on this topic. And I realized that everyone has a stake in this topic. The law students, of course, are interested in a lot of things, but they're interested in the kind of legislation and the policy. Of course, the nursing students are interested in health. The planning students are interested in the siting, you know, where everything goes and geography similar to that. Environmental science students, that makes sense, right? So everyone really has kind of a role or a place in this. And what um, what this told me is how important it is for environmental assessments to be also to be interdisciplinary. Uh, there's a colleague, a professor at King's um, who is doing just that. He has a SHRP grant and he's looking at how we can make environmental impact assessments much more interdisciplinary because what I argue in my book is that it's, be, it's been the domain of environmental scientists, the people who look at environmental assessments or create them or implement them, it's often done through an environmental science lens, but we need a health professional on board. We need a sociologist on board. We need um, political scientists on board. We need an interdisciplinary group of people involved because it's such an interdisciplinary topic. And, and I think environmental assessments, for example, need to consider the health impacts of putting an industry in an indigenous community. Indigenous communities fare worse than any other community in Canada with respect to health. And when we put an industry in their community, when they've had a legacy of health issues, we further compromise that community, we worsen their health effects because they're dealing with so many social determinants of health, right? So this is why we need different eyes on environmental assessments to look at the full scope um, of the full social context of communities before you put, decide to put a landfill in their community. So it's been great working with students a Dalhousie from so many different disciplines. They've been so enthusiastic um, about this topic. And uh, yeah, I, I, it made me very hopeful for the future actually uh, with this generation of students and young people. They're so passionate about these topics, climate change specifically, but also environmental racism. I've actually used um, the media to my benefit. Uh, this is also part of awareness raising. Um, I continue to give interviews to all media outlets because once again, I realized that we need to create awareness, we need to create empathy. Um, and I don't want people to continue to say environmental racism, what's that? Like, I think it's it's past time that people know about this term um, and, they're, and they are, you know, I'm getting that sense from other parts of Canada. Now that I'm in Ontario, yeah, I mean, people know the term. Um, and I'm being invited for talks a, a lot and media here are interested in this topic. So it's working. The awareness raising has paid off. Um, now we get to Elliot Page. So this has been really exciting, you know, to have connected with Elliot in the fall of 2018 through Twitter of all places. Um, I don't have much time to tell the story, but I was just really shocked and I didn't know it was the actor. I thought I didn't realize it. So I kind of left my Twitter page. I, I came back a few weeks later and I was like, oh, I guess it is the actor. Why is he reaching out to me? I didn't, I didn't get it. Um, but eventually, of course, after the shock wore off, I, I DM'd him and thanked him for promoting my book on Twitter and for talking about how he wants to support the the communities on the front line. And you know, so we, we had a conversation at the end of 2018 through Lil McPherson, who you know owns the Wooden Monkey, uh, who's been a longtime friend of Elliot's. And she and I were sitting doing a project with the East Coast Environmental Law Association. So that I think we got to talking and she realized I connected with Elliot. And then she said to me, do you want me to set up a phone call? And I said, yes, that would be great. I had a phone call with Lil and Elliot at the end of 2018, and then another phone call to decide what are we going to do 
in January 2019. And we decided eventually that we would post some 10 minute video clips on Twitter. That's actually what the plan was. It wasn't to go to the Toronto International Film Festival or to produce a 70 minute film. It was to post some 10 minute clips to raise awareness about environmental racism. Then Elliot came to Halifax uh, April 13th of 2019 to film, um, film for six days. And then I went back to his mother's home and they allowed me to look at a rough cut of the film. And then I, I looked at it and I said, this is really emotional. I just don't think 10 minute clips on Twitter is gonna do this justice. I think if we really wanna raise awareness about environmental racism, we need a feature film. We need something 60 minutes, et cetera. And then uh, 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 Ian Daniel, the co-director said, are you saying something like a 70 minute film? I said, yeah, I said, go big or go home. Like, why do this if we're not gonna go big and we wanna raise awareness and I think we should go bigger. And they all decided that yes. And I started to talk about film festivals <laughs> and, uh, and I started talking about Toronto Inter International Film Festival because I know that's the most important film festival in the world. And I started talking about other film festivals and I said, why don't we submit it, you know, more awareness. This is knowledge mobilizing, you know, in academia. This is what uh, we want, we're supposed to do. So we did, so we, we rushed to the deadline. Actually the deadline had passed, but Elliot is friends with Cameron Bailey, who's the head of, head of TIFF. So we got in. And uh, we screened the film on September 9th, 2019. There we are in the Elgin Theater in Toronto. And this was just a real great time. We were able to speak with media from around the world, Rolling Stone Magazine, Time Magazine, LA Times, et cetera, et cetera, to talk about the film and to talk about environmental racism, you know, so more awareness raising. And then later that year, around October, the, it was announced that uh, it would start streaming on Netflix. Now, I already knew that, but um, yeah, that announcement came out uh, October, I guess, 2019, and then it started streaming on March 29th, 2020 on Netflix. And this has also been a gift because Netflix, of course, is global. And I received a lot of response, a lot of emails from people around the world saying how inspirational the women in the film uh, were you know people like Doreen Bernard and the grassroots grandmothers and and uh, and Louise DeLille and Shelburne they're so inspiring what can I do once again empathy that creates action people are like what can I do how can I help so this has really been a gift uh, since then uh, last year I connected with an environmental activist uh, in Toronto before I left Halifax and he said I love what you're doing with the Enrich project but have you ever thought of going beyond Nova Scotia and I said, I've thought of it, you know, but I just can't handle it. It's too much for me. I'm just one person. I don't have the capacity. He said, well, why don't we co-found something? And we did. End of December last year, we co-founded the Canadian Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice. And this is different from the Enrich Project in that it's, it's across Canada. We're looking at all provinces. And we've brought together now probably over 50 different organizations in the environment and climate change sector to share skills, share resources, share expertise with the end goal of addressing environmental racism across Canada. We have people like the David Suzuki Foundation, Eco Justice, East Coast Environmental Law Association, West Coast Environmental Law Association, Environmental Defense, et cetera, et cetera. It's been really, it's a lot of work. We have six working groups and we do our work through those working groups. We're taking uh, three black uh, youth to COP26, I guess it's Sunday or next week, which is very exciting. We got some money to do that. And uh, one of our goals is to kind of make sure that disadvantaged or marginalized young people uh, get opportunities that they would not normally have, particularly because the environmental sector is extremely white and uh, black people and other racialized people often don't have these opportunities. So I know my partner is very, and I am as well, very passionate about making sure that we give opportunities to people who are excluded from the very much white environmental sector. Uh, so we're doing a lot of stuff right now. Um, I don't have time to talk about it, but um, one of the things that we did was the legislation you probably know about is Nova Scotians Bill 111 that Lenore Zan and I developed back in 2015. It went to second reading uh, in Nova Scotia in uh, November, on November 25th. 2015, but it never got past that. And she did reintroduce it up until 2018. And yeah, nothing ever came of it. So 
She introduced it as a federal bill February of last year. We kind of modified it together. It, uh, it went very far. It was approved at second reading. It was approved at amendments. And if the election wasn't called, it had a good chance of becoming actually legislation, the first environmental racism legislation in Canada. However, the election was called. And as you probably know, uh, private members' bills are just kind of wiped off the table. So it died. Um, what we're trying to do now is to get it reintroduced as a government bill rather than a private member's bill because private government bills tend to pass through, this is what I was told, pass through parliament much faster. So two weeks ago, I just mentioned my coalition. We got together, David Suzuki was a signatory, Eco Justice, all these organizations, there were about 20 of us. Uh, we signed a letter, we sent it to the prime minister asking him um, to reintroduce bill C-230 as a government bill and also reminding him that he has made statements about the fact that he is actually um, committed well, not him, I think it was Wilkinson, that he's committed to addressing this issue. So I really think it has a chance. Now we've got a new environment minister. I kind of refashioned that letter and I sent that letter to the new, he hasn't been put in place yet, but I think his name is Stephen Gilbo. Uh, I sent the letter to him as well on Tuesday. And I guess we'll see what happens. But uh, I really want to see finally this bill turn into legislation in Canada so we could Oh, uh, we can see the first environmental racism bill probably in North America, because they don't have one in the United States. Uh, so that's a snippet of some of the work that I've been doing uh, through the Enrich Project. Just to conclude, I want to say that there is a link between corporate power, privilege, environmental racism, and climate change. Therefore, any response to environmental racism and climate change that does not recognize the complex ways in which social, economic, and political systems result in privilege and disadvantage in ways that give some people a pass and make others pay will be meaningless. It's up to those with power and not the people impacted by these injustices to address the problem of environmental racism and climate inequities. Those who have the most influence and the strongest voice should be part of, of the solution. If real action on these issues is to be realized, it must be premised on an understanding that the climate crisis and environmental racism require rapid, large-scale political action and systemic change. And it's the companies and institutions responsible for the crisis that need to pay. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Waldron, for that very powerful presentation. Um, we are even more grateful than we were before that, given the uh, unbelievable amount of work that you're currently involved in that you uh, um, uh, spared the time today to uh, come and talk to us. So thank you so much again for that. Um, this was really insightful and I myself have a few questions, but um, I'm going to, to let them for the moment. We only have a, uh, 10 minutes for questions. So I see that there are two questions in the chat and one in the Q&A. So I'm going to um, move to those. And if, if anybody else has other questions, please uh, make sure to add them in the, in the Q&A um, uh, box. So first question is from uh, Team Transparency. Um, thank you for a very informative presentation. My question concerns the growing international dimension to the industrial and household waste dumping. Uh, we see industrial and household waste from advanced capitalist economies, such as the US, UK, EU being dumped or exported to uh, least developed economies. Would you conceptualize this practice as environmental racism? And if so, why? Yeah, um, there is an, there's a term environmental racism and there's of course the term environmental injustices. I think, you know, so people have said to me, for example, um, what you're talking about is happening in Montserrat, as had people say that in the Caribbean or in different African countries. And typically environmental racism is about the fact that those in power who are typically white from members of the elite group are, are involved in the siting of industries in racialized communities. So racism is salient in the environmental racism definition. I think when you have communities in other countries that are homogenous racially, um, it's probably not as much a case of environmental racism, it's a case of environmental injustice. So I think, I think racism plays out in very specific ways in North America. But when we talk about 
um, some of these wastes going to marginalized or underdeveloped or developing countries around the world, yes, many of those countries are racialized individuals, right? So it is still an issue of race because we're talking about corporate power and those who hold that power are typically members of the elite white uh, class. So it becomes an issue of social class and race when we talk about these ways uh, traveling around the world. But I would say that in countries that are racially homogenous, uh, like in Montserrat or different countries in the Caribbean or in different countries in Africa, it's environmental injustice. And typically it's based on issues of class because a class becomes salient, right? Different things become, you know, I've talked to my students who talk about the fact that religion is salient when it comes to environmental injustices in their home country, right? So it really is about the makeup of the population. So when I think of, for example, when I had a talk with the, with the gentleman from Montserrat, what he was talking about was that low income individuals in Montserrat were the people who were closest to dumps. That's an issue of social class, right? They were not putting it in communities that were also black as Mon Montserrat is like 95% black, but they were putting it in, in low income communities that were black. So it's, it becomes sal so class becomes salient, socioeconomic status becomes salient. So it's really about the makeup of the population and who is holding power in that particular country. So in a way, I suppose it's fair to say that environmental racism is a specific form of environmental injustice, right? Oh, you... yeah, but um, in the Canadian literature, those terms are used interchangeably, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. So in the Canadian literature, you will see people talking about environmental justice, for example, but talking about all this, the ills, the environmental ills. Mm -hmm. And so when I read that, I say, well, where's the justice? You're talking about environmental racism. Now, the justice, for example, would be the tools or apparatus that you would use to address environmental racism. So, for example, Bill C-230 is an example of environmental justice. It's an example of a tool that you would use to address the condition of environmental racism. We can use environmental injustice as a catch-all for different forms of environmental burdens. Um, and whether it be class being salient or race being salient, they're all aspects of environmental injustices. But when we contextualize these issues in North America, as I do, because uh, most of my work is about North America, race then becomes salient, just like class becomes salient. And environmental racism has a different flavor when it's contextualized within white dominant society. So whether it's somebody who is of a marginalized spiritual or religious group, uh, people who are low income or people who are racialized, if they're closest to toxic burdens and they're members of a marginalized religious, racial, socioeconomic group, that is all considered to be environmental injustices. I just think it's important to point out what's creating it. If it's religion, mm -hmm. then make that salient and highlight that. And that's why I highlight racism because I know that in North America, uh, you have to ask the question, why is it that it's primarily non-white communities that are near to these sites. That means that race is salient. Regardless of whether or not people say to me, it's not about race, it's about class, it's, race becomes salient and it intersects with class. And when we talk about racism, we have to, we have to kind of understand or, or look at why is it that racialized communities are low income? That requires us to go back uh, to colonialism, right? Um, so race is salient and these communities are low income for a particular reason. Some people came as slaves, right? Some people were colonized and the resources extracted for, from them. So they're racialized and they're low income and, and but, but it's race that's salient, right? The poverty and the fact that they're poor has everything to do with racial categories that were created by Europeans and their colonization help to create the situation that many, for example, African Nova Scotians and Mi'kmaq communities are in right now. So race becomes salient, class is an aspect of that. Thank you so much. This was, this is very, this was very helpful, actually. Uh, I, I've never thought about this distinction and I think a lot of uh, members of the audience haven't. Uh, so this, is, this has actually been really, really uh, an, an important uh, 
uh, question, I think. Uh, we have two more questions. I think we only have time for one. Um, it's in the chat and um, says, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk, Dr. Waldron. I was really interested in your comments about making environmental impact assessments more interdisciplinary. Can I ask you to expand on that and explain who is missing and what kinds of expertise or ways of knowing are needed? In other words, is it important to make it not just more interdisciplinary, but also more open, inclusive, and democratic? Yes. So there's a term called participatory democracy. So when, for example, indigenous communities say, we weren't consulted, or we were consulted when the project already started, or we were consulted at the end of the process, this is an aspect of participatory democracy. But I would say that participatory democracy is not only about making sure that people are at the table, and people are invited, but it's also about the approach that you use, right? So when I think of environmental assessments, I say to myself, environmental assessments, and I'm not an expert on it, but it's very much steeped in Euro-Western ideology. And classic Euro-Western ideology sees distinctions um, between the environment, between our health, between our body. They see these things as separate, sorry. They see these things as independent. And we know that when we think of traditional indigenous knowledge um, that it's holistic, that indigenous people's framework, their ways of knowing is about holism, the connection between the mind, the body, the spirit, the land, the animals, the, the water, et cetera. They see these things as intertwined. So when, for example, indigenous people say, when you desecrate my land, you harm my body, you harm my community. That's basically what they're saying, that we don't see these things as separate. Environmental assessments are carried out and created within a kind of Euro-Western knowledge framework, right? So I would say that not only should environmental assessments be interdisciplinary and have different people at the table because there's so many different perspectives that they can bring, but it also means that you have to have indigenous voices at the table because their epistemology, indigenous epistemology, uh, has to be incorporated into how environmental assessments are created and how they are carried out. And that's what's not being done, right? And, and people don't want to do that because then they might have a different result. It might mean that they can't put that pipeline in that indigenous community, which is what they want. So yes, when we talk about inclusivity, it's not only about the technicalities around bringing indigenous people to the table to participate making it democratic in an environmental assessment is about how are you doing it? Do you want them to just participate or do, do you want them to tell you how they see the world? Because the ways in which an environmental assessment needs to be carried out has to, for me, be shaped by the ways in which they see the world. And we, once again, we call that indigenous epistemology, but basically it's about uh, interdependence, interconnectivity of mind, body, soul, spirit, water, land, uh, uh, animals, insects, there's no separation, which is the antithesis to your Western thought. Does that make sense? Thank you so much for this. Um, I think there is another question, but we are at the end of our time now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Waldron, for joining us today. This has been such an enlightening uh, conversation, I'm sure for many of us. Um, and uh, there will be, the recording will be available, I think on Monday on uh, the law school's uh, YouTube channel. So, and I'm gonna tweet it so people can uh, rewatch it and, uh, and share it with others if they are interested. Um, thank you again for all the work that you're doing in this field. Thank you um, very much. Uh, and there are lots of thank yous again in, uh, uh, in the chat there for you, Dr. Waldron. Indeed, it was a real treat oh. to hear you speak. Uh, <laughs> I wish um, I get to look at the chat. <laughs> Okay. Yes, yeah, so yeah. you should have a look. Uh, people are very grateful for that. And thank you again for taking the time. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Yeah, good luck. <laughs>